So thank you all for joining us this evening. If we haven't had a chance to meet in person, um, my name's Angela Randian. I'm the social worker at the high school. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being with us tonight. I understand there's, there will also be several Life Academy members joining us. So that's really exciting. Um, we have had Hinkle, Fingles, Pryor and Fisher uh, speak with our families on a number of occasions and uh, our parents always walk away with a wealth of information. So we're always happy to have them with us. Um, so I would like to present uh, Maria Fisher. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Angela said, my name is Maria Fisher and I'm an attorney with Hinkle, Pryor and Fisher. And I'm here tonight to present to you on the topic of um, supplemental security income, Medicaid and other benefits. Um, so these benefits are very important for individuals with disabilities because they do help us to get support services um, and help, uh, help the individual be as independent as possible. So we're gonna talk about um, how we apply for the different benefits, what they actually are, um, and what the criteria for eligibility is. Um, just a tiny little bit about me. So um, I have three children. My middle daughter is 27 and she's an individual with autism. Um, so sometimes when I'm talking about this and I'll start to explain something about the criteria, I sometimes use her as an example. So you hear me talk about Tracy when we're going through this, that's who I'm talking about. And I often use her as an example because sometimes it's just easier to make it personal and here's what it looks like. You know, a person who does this would be eligible for this and a person who functions here would be eligible for something different. It kind of can be helpful just to kind of make it not be just so many numbers that we're throwing at you. Um, so the first thing that I'm gonna start with um, is the Social Security Administration. Oh, a couple things housekeeping wise, feel free to turn your cameras on. It's not distracting to me if you walk away from your cameras. I know people feel like, oh, I, if I'm not gonna stay on the whole time, I shouldn't turn my camera on. Doesn't distract me, doesn't bother me at all. We do just ask that you do keep your um, mute on during the presentation because we all will have background noise and I will apologize in advance. I am also working from home today. So if there's background noise here, my children are home, hopefully it won't be too distracting for you guys. Don't worry, I will just ignore it. Um, and the other thing is question wise. So while I'm talking, you may have questions. Something I say may not be clear or you may just have a question that you wanna clarify. Um, we ask that the questions be kind of general in nature, not super specific just to your child. And that's for two reasons. One, it's a little hard to answer those in a group because sometimes I have to ask a next question to get enough information and it may not be what you wanna share with an entire group. And the other reason is we kind of want it to sort of be that everybody can benefit from the question. If we go too far down a rabbit hole with this, um, something that's very specific, everybody else in the group it might not apply to them. So we're gonna to try to keep those questions general. There is a chat box. Now, depending on what, you, what type of device you're on, whether you're on a laptop or your phone or some kind of a like iPad or something like that, these buttons seem to show up in all different places. For me, my buttons show up down at the bottom if I move my cursor and there's one that says chat. If you click on that chat box, you're able to type in a question. And there are options to, um, to that. You can send it to everyone, but then that does mean that everybody who's here will um, be able to see your question. If you're not comfortable having the question seen by the entire group, please send it to Angela because she's gonna monitor the chat box. So that would require when you're in the chat box as a way to click on a name, click on her name specifically, and then she'll see it. She's going to ask the questions of me as we're going through. Um, so um, hopefully that makes sense and we can make this run as smoothly as possible. All righty, so back to the um, Social Security Administration. So the Social Security Administration has three main benefits. One of them are our Social Security retirement benefits. So for those of us who are working and been paying into a system, at a point where you're retiring, we have an anticipation that we'll receive um, monthly amount of income based on what our work history was. So that's one benefit. There's another benefit, which is Social Security Disability Insurance. That is a, also a program through Social Security, which requires an individual to have worked, paid into the system enough quarters, and then if the individual were to become disabled, they would receive a monthly um, benefit amount to help them 
with their basic needs. And again, that amount is based on what you have paid into the system. For most of us who are here um, with a child with a disability, we're not typically looking at those two benefits because typically our child has not worked, my daughter Tracy has not worked, or at least not worked substantially enough where she would even be eligible for a social security disability insurance benefit. So that last benefit from the Social Security Administration is called Supplemental Security Income, SSI. And I try to make the point of that because a lot of times when people go to apply, they accidentally apply for SSDI because it has the word disability and they go, oh, that must be what it is. But it's not. SSDI is for somebody who's worked and paid into the system. So we're going to look at the Supplemental Security Income Benefit. And this is a benefit for an individual who is unable to engage in substantial gainful activity, which is Social Security's way of defining work. So you're gonna, when you're in the world of Social Security, you hear SGA all the time because SGA is like this big criteria. What does it really mean? Well, right now in 2021, it means that an individual due to a disability would not be able to earn $1,310 in a one month period. And it doesn't matter if the person is earning it or not earning it, it's what they're able to do. So for instance, if I wasn't working, I would not be able to um, claim an SSI benefit because I'm not earning $1,310 in a month because I would have the capacity, the ability to earn that amount, therefore I would not be eligible. But for a child with a disability like my daughter Tracy, she would not be able to do that. Job requirements would not be things that she would be able to do. She would have difficulty um, processing verbal directions or written directions or following those. So even jobs, um, you know, even a minimum wage level job would probably not be something that she would be able to do for enough hours that she would get to that level. So when she goes, oh, somebody's, ra are you raising your hand? Um, yes, I'll I am. Hi. 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 Um, I had a question. I had a question about that. Certainly. Um, how come I'm receiving money from the state right now? How come if you go to like, say you go to another country, you're not, you don't get the same amount of, you don't get the same amount of money? Um, okay, so I think what you're asking me is you're getting a benefit right now, a monetary benefit from, from the United States federal government, right? Yes, yes. And you're going to go for a visit to another? No, if I ever did, if I ever did, would, would they said that they, they said they wouldn't give it to me. Well, if you're out of the United States for more than 30 days, you do lose these benefits. Ah. Because the benefits are meant for individuals here in the United States. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. You can go for a visit. You know, if you go on a vacation for two weeks, you're not going to lose it. But if you're out of the country for more than 30 days, then yeah. Gotcha. One Thanks. of the rules. Thanks for, for answering my question. Okay. You're welcome. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm going to think where I was. And, uh, so back to um, our eligibility. So if an individual is, un is unable to earn that 1310 in a month because of a, a lack of an ability to obtain and maintain a job at that level, they would be considered to have a disability in the world of Social Security. And once they're considered to have a disability in the world of Social Security, the gate to SSI opens. But that's not the only criteria. So Supplemental Security Income has three it's a three-pronged test. So first test is that disability criteria. The second test is that the individual actually has to have low income and low resources. So what does that mean? Well, it means if the individual has a job and is receiving any funds, um, you know, any income, that would count against them for purposes of their SSI benefit. Um, the limit, is $780 a month. So if an individual is earning more than $780 a month, they would not be eligible for SSI. The trick here though, is it's not only earned income. So it's not only does the individual have a job and is receiving money from their job as far as income, it's any income to the individual. 
So if the individual has what we call unearned income, which would be child support, um, receiving a social security benefit based on a parent's work history, if a parent has passed, is retired, or disabled themselves and receiving a social security benefit, a minor child would receive on that parent's benefit and a child with a disability will receive on a parent's benefit for the rest of that child's life. That unearned income would count against the child for purposes of SSI. So we have to be aware of that if, if somebody has any of those income issues, those are issues you do need to look at. Some of those issues can be corrected. So if the issue is a child support issue, we are able to go to court, have the child support directly ordered into a trust, and based on that, Social Security will disallow um, or not count the money that is child support, so that would go away. Unfortunately, we don't have the same ability to do that with the Social Security benefit that the individual is receiving. However, it is also important to know that an individual who first receives an SSI benefit and then receives on a parent's work history um, will be grandfathered into Medicaid. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but for purposes of receiving SSI income, whether it's earned or unearned, must be below $780. The other- so, Maria, there's a question here. Does this include money from a trust fund? So money from a trust fund, do they mean that they're, um, they're paying it out every month? or they just mean that the money's in the trust itself? Meaning that they're getting money directly from the trust fund, um, or, well, both if they're receiving money monthly from the trust fund, or if the money is being held in trust for them at, till a designated age or. Okay, so the money that's in trust and held in the trust, that's a resource issue. So I'm gonna get to resources next. If money is being paid out of a trust, it's a great question. If the funds are being paid directly out to the individual and they're being paid out as cash, meaning that they are available to the, to the individual who's going for benefits, that they could use it for food, clothing, and shelter, those funds will be counted as income and they will count against the individual for purposes of benefits. If on the other hand, the money in the trust is being paid out, let's say for therapies or doctor bills, if you pay it directly to the third party provider, so you're pay, you pay it directly to the doctor or to the therapist or to um, you know, a caregiver, that will not count. But if, it's, if you take $1,000 a month and you just put it in an account in the name of the individual who's trying to get benefits and that individual is able to use that money for food, clothing and shelter by social security rules, that will be deemed to be income and it will count against the individual. The other thing to understand is that with these benefits, when a child is under the age of 18, if you apply for these benefits, um, they count the parent's income and resources against the child. So it becomes a family test, not just an individual test. Once the child turns 18, that stops. The family income and resources fall away and they look just at the child themselves. So typically it's at age 18 that we begin the application process for SSI because for most individuals, that's when the child will be eligible because then we're looking at the child's income and the child's resources. Um, so that's the income portion of the test. Now we get to the last portion of the test, which is the resource portion. The resource portion says that the individual has to have low resources. So all combined, the individual cannot have more than $2,000 in their name. That means uniform gift to minor accounts, savings accounts, checking accounts, savings bonds, you name it, whatever it would be. If that individual has more than $2,000 in their name, they will not be eligible for an SSI benefit. Um, so if you're thinking about this and you're thinking that, oh, you know, I didn't realize this and I've, you know, I've saved money in my child's name and it's an account actually in their name. What am I going to do about this? Um, well, if your child's like under the age of 15, you can move that money because you're outside of a look, any look back period. Um, if not, if you're closer, then you've got to figure out what you're going to do with it. So you can spend it down for something for fair market value. So 
So if it's a couple of thousand dollars, I'm sure there's something that the child needs that you can actually just spend the money on. Um, if, it's more, if it's more than that, um, but let's say it's under $15,000, um, you can open an ABLE account. The funds can then be moved into an ABLE account. When the funds are in an ABLE account, they are not accounted resource. That's just the rule of the account. That's how the government authorized them. But there are limitations. You can only put $15,000 in a year. So if you've got $100 and you're looking for your child to be eligible for benefits in two years, you're not going to be able to get rid of $100,000 in that period of time by using an ABLE account because the most you'd be able to do is move $30,000 in in that period. Um, so then your other alternative would be a trust. Um, and there are two kinds of trusts. And this type of trust, so if we have money that's in the individual's name, let's say the individual had $100,000 in their name in a savings account that was being saved since they were little, um, that money belongs to the individual. So in order for them to be able to be eligible for benefits, those funds would have to be moved into what we call a first party trust. A first party trust says the person who wants benefits has money, we're gonna put their money into a trust. The government has oversight into those trusts. They get to get an annual accounting, um, they get to, you know, see how the funds are being spent. And when the individual passes, if there is a, a lien for services provided through Medicaid, um, through the government, they would be able to recoup whatever was paid out by taking what's left in that trust. Because what the government's basically saying is we could have said to you, we're not going to give you any benefits until you spend the money down and you would have spent down the 100000 and then gotten benefits. Instead, we said to you, put the 100000 in a trust so you can use it for the things that we won't give you because the government is only giving you um, funds for your basic needs. But if you don't use it during your lifetime, it is only fair that you then pay us back for what we've paid out for the individual. That's a first party special needs trust. Now, somebody asked the question before, what about money that's in a trust? It depends on the trust. If funds are in a special needs trust, whether that be a first party or a third party trust, they will be considered excluded for purposes of the resource test for SSI. But not all trusts are special needs trusts. So there are other types of trusts that are out there. Some of them are living trust, minor trust, um, sometimes is you know, a trust that's set up by um, you know, a grandparent that you know, left funds to their children, then to their grandchildren. There may not be any provisions in that trust about somebody with special needs. So you really have to look at the trust to make a determination about whether it meets the criteria for a special needs trust and to be excluded. Because if it doesn't meet the criteria for a special needs trust, it will not be excluded and it will count against the individual. And then the individual will not be eligible for benefits. Any questions on the resource part of that? Would you recommend that um, if parents get the special needs trust that they're giving that information to loved well, ones so that if the loved one does yeah. pass that they have it left towards yeah, and planning on leaving towards the, the person with special okay. needs that is placed in that trust instead of placed someplace else? Absolutely. So when we do, we work with families quite often to set up their estate plans, which are their wills and their special needs trusts and a couple of other documents as well. Um, we always give a letter to the clients and say, please share this with your family and meaning like grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever it is that you might think would leave funds to your child because you don't want them to be left to the child directly. You want it to be left to this trust. And in that instance, the money we're talking about is not first party money. That money does not belong to the child who's trying to get benefits, right? So I have a trust for Tracy. When I pass, uh, I have three children, so my estate would be split into three pieces, and each child would get a piece. Tracy's part of it will go into a third party special needs trust. That trust does not have a payback provision to the government. It's still a special needs trust, so it's excluded. Once it's funded, it will still be excluded. It will not count against her for benefits purposes, but at a point where Tracy passes, the government cannot swoop in and say, we're gonna take this money because we provided services. The funds that are left in there will go to my other two children. Um, and that's the difference between a third party trust and a first party trust. But it is critically important that if there's anybody you know of who will leave funds to your child, that you do want them to leave it to the trust, not to the child. 
I think there were some other questions. I saw some hands going up. Um, Ross? Yes. Um, if, uh, if there's a college bound fund set up and let's say it's not fully utilized because the child doesn't go to a four year college or doesn't uh, end up going to college at all, uh, is that considered, does that fall into the category of resources which would eliminate the uh, exclu exclude from benefits? So I think what you're talking about is a 529 plan, right? Yeah. Okay, so that 529 plan, um, as it depends on who's the owner. And most times, the owner of a 529 is not the child, it is the parent. The child is the beneficiary, which can be changed at any time. Okay. So it does, not, it does not count, first of all, while the money's in there, it does not count against the child for benefits because it's not theirs, it's actually yours from a legal perspective. Um, however, one thing you do need to be aware of with 529 plans is that they do have to be used for um, accredited college expenses. So if the child is going to go to a college you know, program that would meet the criteria for um, those funds um, being used, that's fine. But if not, you have two options. Some of those funds can then be moved to an ABLE account, or if you have any other children, you could change the beneficiary to one of your other children and use it for their college. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, any qu other questions on the- uh, Yeah, I had another question from Albie. What about financial loans? Um, Albie, do, you, do you wanna unmute yourself? Maybe you can give your, her a little yes. bit more detail. Oh, yes, I do. Sorry, I'm- That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not the one that answers all these questions, but um, I have a question about financial loans. And it's for me personally, when you reach 21, are you able to get financial loans after, let's say, you graduate or for anyone okay. else? So are you asking me if you could go to a bank and get a loan? No, financial loans, like for college, like grants, like, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, let's say, let's say you don't have enough money to pay for college. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to get a financial loan for that reason? So the answer is yes, there are um, student loans. And anybody who is, who meets the criteria for a student loan would be able to get a student loan. Okay. And Thank you. That has, Okay, that I'm sorry, I'm just trying to explain my question. It's kind of no, hard. no, that's fine. But what that doesn't in, that's not part of the that's not part of SSI or benefits and the um student loans, you know, the criteria for those are you know that you're going to school, you're taking a certain level number of classes, that the cl the college is accredited to a certain point. So you those kinds of things you would have to meet. But that's that's different, and that won't thank you. That won't thank affect you. your benefits. Thank you for answering. I'm I was just wondering. Okay, Thanks. that's great. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So for the purposes of SSI, uh, we have gone through um, the disability test, the income test, and the resource test. So now, how exactly do we apply for these benefits? Well, so in a COVID world, it's actually a little bit easier than in a non-COVID world. Some things do get easier. Um, so in a non-COVID world, um, some of the social security offices require you to go down, sit there, take a number, wait and wait and wait and fill out paperwork and all of this. In a COVID world, social security is closed. Their offices are not open. Nobody's allowed to go there. You can't go in. So you call up and you make an appointment over the phone and they will call you, they'll set an appointment for you, they'll call you back and they will start the intake process. The critical thing to remember is for the person who you are applying for the benefit for is that the, you want to wait until after their 18th birthday. Because if you do it before time, remember I said parent income and resources count, most individuals would not be eligible um, for benefits. Um, so you wanna wait until after the 18th birthday. The actual beginning of the application process is pretty simple. Um, I know when I did it with my daughter, Tracy, 
Um, the only thing I had to look up that I wouldn't have known off the top of my head was a social security number and only because I don't have it memorized and I still don't. So um, everything else that they asked, you know, a parent's going to know, or if you're doing it yourself, you're going to know. They want to know things like your date of birth, schools that you've gone to, who are your doctors, hospitalizations, diagnoses, because what they're going to do is they're going to send out release forms to get information directly from these sources. And that's what compiles the social security file. And what they're looking for is information that helps them understand whether or not you have an ability to work. That's what they're really looking for. Um, they're also going to send out a questionnaire for the individual themselves to complete and a questionnaire for another adult, a third party adult to fill out. So when Tracy got her questionnaire, I also got one. I filled one out. I sent mine back. And then I had the one that was for Tracy to fill out. Well, Tracy um, would not have been able to fill it out herself. Um, it's approximately 20 some odd pages. It's a lot of questions about um, can you lift things? How much can you lift? How far can you walk? How many breaks do you need? Um, how do you take care of your activities of daily living? Can you cook? Can you take care of other people? So it's very lengthy. She would not have been able to complete this. I completed it for her and made a note um, at the end of it that basically said that, you know, she needed my help and uh, therefore I filled it out. You send these two questionnaires back and then kind of the social security process takes on a life of it own, its own. It all kind of depends on the information they've received. If the information they received makes it clear that the individual does meet the disability criteria and also meets the um, income and resource criteria, you'll get a letter saying that you're eligible. If they find that you have resources that maybe you didn't know about, happens sometimes, not too often, but you know, sometimes we find that people have um, savings bonds that they've forgotten about and somehow Social Security knows about it. So, you know, they'll come back and say, you know, we've determined that you have $10,000 and this is where it is. Um, you have to address it. You have to address the resource problem. If they come back and say that you have income, well, then you got to address that, the income issue. Um, but as long as all those boxes get checked, that they agree you have a disability, agree that your income is below 780 and your resources are below 2000, you should receive a letter saying that you are eligible for SSI. And I think, it, how do you say Alivario? I think he has another question. Can you unmute? Yes, yes. How, now, how come, like, let's say, for instance, you go to work, you go to work and you get a job and SSI says, I says there's so, so much of my money you can make. Now, what I'm trying to say is why, why, do they make their rule you only allowed to make a certain amount of amount of money? And and if you get and if you get a job and they see you working, well, they'll take it away from you. Well, because that's just the rules. Okay. So Okay. I'm I'm sorry. I know I'm sorry. I know I know I thought there was different rules they changed over the years. I'm confused. Like I just you know. So let me so um as yeah. a program that the government is giving to you. It's not okay. thing that you, um, so remember I talked about those other benefits at the beginning. So those are entitlement benefits. So if I pay okay. a lot of, if I pay in money every time I get paid, when I'm ready to retire, I have an entitlement to those funds because I paid in. So, gotcha. I paid in so the individual getting SSI hasn't paid in. So the government is allowed to put rules on there. About gotcha. who can get it. And that's just the rules that they have. They're kind of arbitrary. Like they just pick them. Yeah. They could have picked different numbers, but those are the numbers they picked. Okay. So I have a few other questions yep. uh, that and have come in. Hands, and there are some yeah. hands going up too. So you, whatever okay. you want to do, I'll put you back in charge. <laughs> okay. So um, I have a question again about the special needs trust in general. Should you exclude the child as a beneficiary or should the child special needs trust be the beneficiary? A child's special needs trust should be the beneficiary. I think what the person maybe is talking about is life insurance, 401ks, retirement plans that have beneficiary designations do not exclude your child with um, a disability because for most of us, our largest asset is going to be our retirement plans. And if you exclude your child with special needs from that, there's usually not much that ends up 
outside of that that would fund your special needs trust. But you don't want it to have your child's name. So you're going to put the name of the special needs trust in lieu of where their name would go. So like I have three kids. So it's going to say, you know, my older daughter is going to say Kelly. It's going to say Tracy special needs trust. And it's going to say Matthew. So that's how you would want to, to do that. Next question. If you have guardianship of a young adult over 18, will the SSI questionnaire be filled out by the young adult or by the parent? So that has absolutely no bearing on it. Um, the young adult, if able, should fill out the questionnaire that's for them. Um, the parent or guardian should fill out the one that says third party on it. Um, but in most cases, um, the individual is going to need help filling out that questionnaire. So the parent or guardian can do that as well. And the last question that I have, oh, no, another one too. Um, if the child turns 15, wants to work, but stops working at 18 for community college, will SSI turn down the application and will the work history affect it? That's a hard question to answer. So if the child is able to work substantially at 15, um, and is working substantially at 15 until they go to college. And the reason they now stopped working is because they're in college, not because they have a disability that prohibits them from working. They're not going to be eligible for SSI, but if they're not working substantially and they're working and they are, their work is limited or they need supports or services to maintain that work because of a disability, they could still get SSI. So it's, it's not, that one's a little bit, and it, we've got to like flesh out some of the facts, like how much, how long were they working? How much were they making um, to really give a good answer on that one? Okay. And the last question I have here, uh, do you need a minimum amount of money to start a special needs trust? No, no, you don't. And I see Ross has had his hand up and been super patient. <laughs> so. no, it's fine. It's fine. So if an individual is over 18, and therefore they're considered independent of the resources of the family, and they do qualify uh, for benefits, yet they don't utilize all those benefits because let's say they're still living uh, at home, um, and they end up accumulating, let's say that those benefits start to go into savings, and those savings accumulate past $2,000, does that eliminate them temporarily or does that stop the the benefits it it will um it will stop the benefits and i'm going to talk about that in a second so great segue into like well, exactly where i was going to go because i was going to tell you what the what this ssi benefit actually is and then how you use it and what you have to do but before i jump there um I, christine you had your hand up right yes hi um I've heard from a friend that there's a way of being able to go into a site or some sort of resource just to make sure that your child doesn't have bonds out there that may have kind of slipped through the cracks and you don't know where they are or, or what have you. Is there a way of being able to find that out through some source? So the only source that I know of requires you to have the serial number on the savings bond. Um, if you put, so there's a, that, and this doesn't even tell you necessarily um, that the bond is still out there. So if you have the serial number, you can put it in, it can tell you the present day value, but if you've already cashed it in, it doesn't necessarily know that. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's not a way to call them up and say, my child's name is John Smith. Do you have any bonds for him? And the reason it's really complicated is your child's social security is not always on the bonds. So it, you know, sometimes I buy a bond for somebody when they have a baby. Well, I don't know the baby's social security number and I don't bother to ask the parent. So I use mine because when it gets cashed in, it's gonna get cashed in on theirs. It's not gonna affect me. So there's really not a great way for the, even for the government to sort of track that necessarily. So to the best of my knowledge, is not a way to call up with your name. But let me put it to you this way. If you do not have possession. So let's say social security comes back and says they found $5,000 in bonds and you have no idea where these bonds are. Um, if social security gives you the actual serial numbers, you can contact the department of treasury and you can go through, there's a way to find them, get them cashed and all of that kind of stuff. But you can also prove to social security that you do not have access, know where they are so that they really aren't a resource that's accessible. Um, and they, that will also help you. So, 
So I wouldn't sit here worrying that, oh my gosh, there's a bond out there somewhere and it's gonna mess my, this whole thing up. Um, it's more like the bonds that you have in the back of your drawer that you forget about, those are the ones that are gonna mess you up. Because if they're really gone, that you don't know where they are, there's an argument to be made with social security about that as well. Um, any other questions on that resource part of it? Okay. All right, so what do you get? You've gone through this process now and you're eligible for SSI. So now what happens? Okay, well, the individual is going to get somewhere between five and $700 a month from the federal government in a social security um, benefit. Somebody is gonna be the representative payee, most likely not the individual. Um, if Social Security Administration determines that the individual is not able to manage the funds, then they will name somebody else. So I'm Tracy's representative payee. So I have a bank account, has my name as rep payee with Tracy's name on it. Every month, her SSI benefit gets deposited in there. And then I'm supposed to use that. I'm supposed to use it for her food, clothing, and shelter first. And as long as that's provided, I can use it for anything else that she needs. That is for her sole benefit. Can't take the money and buy something for my son, can't buy something for myself, just for her. It's just for whatever it is that she may need. So question that came up, well, what happens if you don't spend the money and you keep accumulating it? Well, as soon as it goes over $2,000, you're not technically eligible for SSI anymore. Will the Social Security Administration catch that the moment it happens? Probably not, but they are going to catch it. And I have had clients where they get you know, they don't realize that they're over by, you know, two, three hundred dollars. And, you know, three years later, they get a letter saying you got to pay us back your SSI benefits for these months because you are over your resource limit. So it's really incumbent on you to be sure that you're not over that limit and to make sure that you're spending the funds down. And parents often say, well, I'm providing everything. The child's still living here. Like, how am I supposed to do that? It's just about changing your mindset. So every time you go to do something for that child that you ordinarily would just pay for yourself, stop and say, is this only for the child's benefit? If it's for nobody else at all, you should be using their SSI money. So what kinds of things would that be? Clothing, haircuts, medication, uh, doctor co-pays, therapies, anything that is just for that child's benefit. Computer, cell phone, new switch, um, whatever, whatever it is that your child is into, um, that's what you should be using the funds for instead of using your own funds to purchase those things for the child. It really is meant for food, clothing, and shelter. The reason I said before, you'll get between five and $700. If the Social Security Administration determines that somebody is giving this child in-kind support food, clothing, and shelter, um, they will diminish the, the child's benefit from the seven to the 500. Um, so they understand that families are still giving support to the individuals and that's why they lower it. At a point where the child is not living in the home with the parents and whether they're in a supervised living arrangement or an independent living arrangement or a group home, whatever that may look like, that benefit will bounce back up to that 700 to the higher number. Um, because then they're not receiving in-kind support from a parent. So they know that parents are doing in-kind support, um, and yet they still, um, so, they, so they know this so that they don't, it doesn't have to be that all the money goes to food, clothing, and shelter, because some of that is already being provided by the parent. So what's an easy way to make sure you don't go over that money? When that amount comes in, earmark a certain portion of it that is going to be for the child's food bill. Move that over to your own account. That's the amount that the child is gonna to contribute towards food. And you'd be surprised if, if it's $200 a month and you're getting a $500 benefit, that 300 that's left, if you start looking at a cell phone bill, clothes that the child needs, um, you know, entertainment needs, um, doc, doctor visits, all that type of stuff, the money's gonna go and you'd be surprised. You're probably not gonna have as much of a difficult time as you would think so you're not going to have to worry about bumping up against that $2,000 limit. A couple of questions on this. Um, sure. Do you need to keep track of all your receipts? Um, so you can, um, they can audit you and they do. 
Um, so you want to keep track of how the funds are being spent so that if they do question you, you are able to show them that it is being spent for the individual. My recommendation, um, this is not necessarily like legal recommendation, it's, it's more parent to parent <laughs> recommendation. Um, I use a debit card for everything I do with my daughter. Um, and this way, because I did get audited um, and I just sent them the bank statements but I had used a debit card for almost every transaction. So it showed, right, like it was her doctor copay, it had her doctor's name on it. It was the dentist, it had the dentist's name on it, her haircut, it had, you know, the salon on it. So there was very few things that were cash. What really raises an eyebrow with Social Security, Medicaid, when they're looking at bank statements is when there's constant cash transactions where somebody's just taking the money out and they can't account for it, or when the everything's just transferred over to the parent or checks written over to the parent. Those kind of things kind of raise an eyebrow, but if you can sort of show them. Now, larger expenditures that I do for her, I absolutely actually keep the receipt from it. So pre-COVID, we went to a concert. That's a pretty large expenditure. I keep a copy of the charge card statement for her ticket so that I have it. Because if they say to me like, what was that on your credit card? I wanna be able to say, here it is. This is what it was. Um, to be judicious, you know, be reasonable in what you're what you're doing. Larger purchases, I would definitely keep the receipts for, but you know, try to have a paper trail by using a debit card with the account as opposed to just taking cash out and just using cash wherever. Uh, do you recommend that a parent or guardian charges rent and or food for the child? Food, so, I heard you say. Food, definitely. I, I think that that's a very wise thing to do. Rent becomes a little bit um, of a complicated issue. Um, so you can charge your child rent, but remember rent to you is income to you. Talk to your accountant about it. I have had clients who have done that and been unhappy when it came to tax time and they're, um, the, um, the rent has bumped them up into a different tax bracket. Um, so you wanna be careful about what you're charging from a different perspective, but you absolutely can charge the child rent. I think it's better for the child to reimburse you for things or pay for things directly. So reimbursing for food doesn't create a taxable event to you. The child paying directly for their haircuts and their doctors doesn't create a taxable event to you. Um, but that's just my own personal feeling. It's perfectly legal and fine to charge your child rent. Just know, but you have to look at that in the big picture. So does the benefit get taxed or is it straight no. out pay? SSI benefit is not does not get taxed, no tax return needs to be done for the child at the end um, of the year. Okay, and one more question. If you go on a family trip, um, how about a plane ticket? Would that yep, absolutely. be okay? absolutely, okay. absolutely. If you're going on a family trip, child can pay for their own plane ticket, go on to Disney, pay for her own park hopper pass, um, you know, pay for her portion. Like if there's two people staying in the hotel room, she can pay for her portion of that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a couple more. Uh, can SSI be used for piano lessons, yep. those type of things? And what type of account to put the SSI money in? Um, I, I think a checking account is just the easiest way to use it. And then you'll have a debit card that you can use with it. So I think that's good. Um, when you have your representative payee letter, you might want to show it to your bank. Some banks actually set up representative payee accounts. Um, and those are beneficial because you really can't keep high balances in these accounts. Um, so if they know it's a social security account where you can't keep a high balance, they sometimes um, will waive um, fees on those accounts. Any other questions? No? Okay, so Daniel, you have a question? You have to unmute first. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. Are there any things you can't spend the SSI money on? Seems like there's a, lots of things you can. I mean, can't spend it on somebody other than the child whose benefit it is. Okay. That's really the limitation there. So it can, it's not just food and shelter necessarily or clothing. No, it's food, shelter, and clothing first. But if those things are provided, it's anything else for that individual. And then also, because we buy the food as a family, like you said, you could take they could pay you or whatever, $100 a month. Mm -hmm. And you'll just earmark that, that it was for food. Let's Correct. Say. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions with regard to that? 
Oh, okay, hold on. Um, uh, the work will be limited because a few local ShopRite stores have hired teenagers with disability part-time as part of life skills. Is that okay? And after community college, if the individual with disability can't find a job, then goes back to ShopRite for a few hours, will SSI be affected? Um, so if an we have lots of individuals who are on benefits that work um, limited. Um, so my own daughter's in a work program through DDD. So she works at a flower, well, pre-COVID, she works at a flower shop for a couple of hours a week. Um, those funds affect her SSI, but they don't take her SSI away because she doesn't earn, earn over $780. And it's clear based on her disability that she could not maintain a job where she would make $13.10 a month. So if an individual is working at ShopRite, and they're only working five hours a week um, and that's all that they can work, then they would be in that same position. Now, ShopRite is also a compassionate employer. So they're an employer that tailors a job often, they're very open to hiring individuals with disabilities and they do tailor jobs to meet the individual's needs. That also goes to the fact that the individual would not be able to work in substantial gainful activity because they would have to be doing the same job as anybody else. So if they're at a job where they're getting either natural supports at the job or if the job has re reduced the job requirements for the individuals with disabilities but not reduced the pay, those are also arguments that Social Security will look at to say that the person isn't actually engaging in substantial gainful activity. Um, and the same thing, so if they're not working while they're at school and they stayed on their SSI benefit and then they're done with school and they go back to ShopRite, again, that doesn't mean that they're going to lose their SSI benefit. However, just so that you know, when you're working and receiving SSI, your SSI benefit will be reduced. So let's say you're getting $500 a month and you're working and um, you get your paycheck, whatever your paycheck is, Social Security is going to um, forgive the first $20 because they forgive the first $20 of any income. Then they're going to forgive the next $60 of earned income. And then they're going to divide the rest of the paycheck, whatever that might be, um, in half and reduce the Social Security benefit by that amount. So I know it's hard to do numbers without writing them all down. <laughs> but basically, you um, the the benefit will be decreased slightly based on the income. But unless you're working over that 780, you won't lose it completely. And if you can't work over the 1310, you also won't lose it completely. Does that help to answer that question? I have a couple more here. Okay. Um, can funds be used to pay towards utilities and phone and that sort of thing if the child's living at home? Yep, absolutely. Okay. And how is the 13, well, okay. How is the 1310 ability to earn determined and who figures that out? Um, the federal government and that number changes every year and it comes out early in January. So the 1310 number went up from 1260 last year. So last year's SGA number was 1260. It's now 1310 and that number just came out like last week. Okay. Uh, so if we were to debit $100 a month for groceries, we would not be raising eyebrows even though it's made out to a parent regularly. Do we need to itemize the grocery list because it can fluctuate month to month? No, there's a reasonableness to things and how much we can all do drive ourselves crazy. So when my daughter first got her SSI for one year, I tracked every receipt from the grocery store every month. And at the end of every month, I divided it by the number of people in the house and I took the exact amount to the penny and I transferred it over. At the end of the year, I looked back at it and I realized that her portion of our food bill was always somewhere between 190 and $210. Like it was always in that range. So I just decided that I take $200 a month and that's it. That's all she pays for food. 
there's a reasonableness standard. Like you don't really have to, you know, if you were charging her the full $500 for food, I think that would raise an eyebrow, but $100 a month, $200 a month, I, I don't think there's any issue with that. And that's not the kind of thing social security is gonna come after you for. I mean, that's pretty reasonable if you think about somebody being fed for, if it's $100 a month, $25 a week, it's very reasonable. If there's no other SSI questions for the moment, yeah. I'm going to talk oh, about Medicaid. Oh, wait, there's one more. Okay. okay. Can funds be used for dining out? For the individual, yes. Like they can't treat somebody else, but they're, they can pay their portion. So yes. Okay. So Medicaid, another very important benefit. So the nice thing in New Jersey, we just talked all about SSI. When you're eligible for SSI in New Jersey, you are automatically eligible for Medicaid. We're what's called a presumptive eligibility state. So if you're determined eligible for SSI, you'll get a second letter telling you that you're also eligible for Medicaid, asking you to choose between one of the HMO providers. And if you don't send it back in whatever amount of time they tell you, they're gonna pick one for you. They're all about the same. So choose whichever one of the providers you feel would be you're most comfortable with. Like if you have one that happens to match your private insurance, that's probably a good idea. Um, you just choose it, send it back, and now your child also has Medicaid. Medicaid is a payer of last resort. Um, so if your child can stay on your private insurance and is on your private insurance, you want to keep that for as long as you can or as long as it's financially feasible for your family. Um, and use Medicaid as the secondary payer with regard to health insurance. Um, by law, any, all children can stay on parents' policies until they're 26. In New Jersey, certain policies even allow a child to stay on until they're 30. Those are things to check with your human resources department for your um, policy that's through your employer. The other thing to check is a lot of employers have a caveat on the policies that allow a child with a disability to remain on the policy for as long as the parent is working for that company and also on those benefits. So you might wanna find that out um, and then you can make a decision about whether you're gonna keep the private insurance in place as well, well as having the Medicaid. The real critical reason that we want individuals with disabilities to have Medicaid is not necessarily for the medical part of the benefits but because Medicaid is going to provide supports and services. Things like job coaching, um, residential um, services and supports, day programming, um, community activities. Um, so when the school bus stops coming at age 21 and you need some place to go, if your child's not able to work or not going to um, a VOTEC, a college program, a college experience program, whatever that may be, if that child is going to be going um, some other type of programming, like my own daughter who went to DDD programming, all of that program is funded um, through Medicaid. So you want to make sure that the child has Medicaid because that creates that funding source. So first way that we get Medicaid is that we have gotten SSI and you automatically have your Medicaid. If for some reason you're not able to get SSI, um, there are other ways to get Medicaid. So one of the ways to get Medicaid is there's a program called Aged Blind Disabled Medicaid. And this doesn't give you a monthly amount of money coming in like SSI does, but it does give you the Medicaid coverage. Um, for this program, an individual's income has to be um, below 11, 1150, and their resources also have to be below the $2,000. This you apply not to the federal government through a social security administration, but you apply through your local county board of social services for the county in which you live. I believe most of those counties are not um, seeing people either right now. So I think they're all doing their applications as well by mail. I don't know of any of them that are actually seeing people, um, but they are. there are people who go in, they do get the applications, they are definitely being processed. Um, so if you're if this is something you want to do, you can still do it now. It's not like you can't. Um, so that's the age blind disabled. A lot of questions here that I got was about working. So a lot of times people are concerned, don't really care so much about that SSI benefit. I want my child to be able to work, 
but my child is going to need a job coach in order to do that. Well, how do I make that happen? Well, you make that happen by applying for workability. So workability is another Medicaid program that allows for an individual who is between the ages of 16 and 64, um, who is working, as long as they're working actually has taxes being taken out. It can't be that mom hires you to go to the mailbox and get the mail. Um, it has to be a job where you actually get a pay stub and there are taxes taken out. Um, you can be earning up to $30,000, $40,000 a year. You could have $20,000 in liquid resources and they will not count against you um, retirement account or pensions that are based on your own work history. Very different program than the other ones that we've all talked about. Um, but it's a really good catch-all for an individual who is able to work and is, you know, maybe works over that 780 um, and isn't able to get SSI or even, you know, works over SGA and isn't able, you know, to get benefits that way, but does need job coaching supports for work. Um, workability still will connect you with DDD so that you can get job coaching. Um, so those are the main ways that individual disabilities get Medicaid. Any questions on those? Um, I did see a question from Albie came in a little bit ago. Um, uh, which provider is the best and why does secondary insurance not matter? Okay, so I don't, I think the question is which provider, which Medicaid provider is the best? I don't know. I mean, I think they're all pretty much the same because Medicaid is, you know, the, you, the rates are set, the doctors are set, so they're all pretty much the same. So I don't know of any, I've never had anybody say, gee, I love my Medicaid provider. This is the best one. Um, so like I said, just choose one of them. What's the other part of the question? Um, why does the secondary insurance not matter? I don't think I said the secondary insurance doesn't matter. What I said is Medicaid is a um, a provider of last resort. So it does become secondary to your primary insurance. However, if you have private insurance um, and you're going to a private doctor, it's very likely that doctor is not going to be a Medicaid doctor. So they're not, Medicaid won't pick up those copays. Um, so for the most part, if you're using private insurance, the Medicaid's not going to dovetail into your regular sort of checkups. Um, and that type of thing. It will be a secondary to hospitalizations, but what we really use Medicaid for is the support services. So it's not that it doesn't matter as a secondary, but it's the real benefit we're looking for is the support services, the job coaching, the day programs, the residential supports that you can't get without Medicaid. Is that a little bit clearer? Um, I think Albie um, got kicked off or left, so. Oh, okay. Um, do, oh, okay. You, do you need to apply for Medicaid separately if you get SSI? No, absolutely not. Medicaid, we're a presumptive eligibility state. If you get SSI, there is no Medicaid application that you have to fill out at that time. It's only if you don't get the SSI that then you would apply to the Medicaid. Correct. If for right. some reason you're not SSI eligible, mm -hmm. but you you can still be eligible for each, either age blind, disabled, or workability, then you would have to apply for it separately. Those are just ways to get it if you don't get SSI. Right. Okay. Right. Um, how do we apply for the workability program and does this include job placement? It does not include job placement. It's just a Medicaid program and you would apply through the Board of Social Services. You would let them know, but that's the Medicaid program that you are applying for. And is Access Link through Medicaid or SSI? Access Link is its own thing. Okay. So you have to right. actually contact them, apply to them. I believe they need a, a note saying that you're an individual with a disability and then you have to just get set up with them separately. So you, you, can, you don't have to have SSI or Medicaid to get Access Link. Right, uh, um, not to go off on Access Link, but Access Link is available when your your uh, child is 11 years old. You, that's when you can actually apply that young. Um, and you can go to New Jersey Transit to mm -hmm. apply on there. 
Um, as a school, we can't do anything because it's all information that the family has to give. So that's something you would have to do online. Um, so Access Link is a great resource um, to use for that. And we actually now have connections with DDD and DVRS. So we'll have somebody come in and talk to Life Academy to, to help with the DVR is to help a vocational placement and things. So they'll be able to explain more. That's all I'll say because this isn't my show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's fine. That was great. <laughs> One more question. Um, so, will you get a letter stating that you are eligible for Medicaid? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. When the, when they process your application, you'll get a letter either saying you're denied or you're eligible. It'll tell you the date that you're eligible. And if you get it through SSI, you're going to get a letter that says. You've just been determined eligible for SSI, therefore you're eligible for Medicaid, please pick one of the providers. So you absolutely be notified in writing on all of those things. Okay. Uh, one more thing, what if my family are already Medicaid eligible? How would one with a, with a disability child with ADHD find out about any resources and take advantage of at the certain age? So you can't be on more than one Medicaid program at a time. You're not allowed to. So I don't know what Medicaid program the person's on right now, but it's probably not one that's connected to a disability. So if the child has a disability that is going to warrant them needing support services or getting connected to like a DDD, they, they are going to need to get to connected to one of the Medicaid programs that we're talking about because not every Medicaid program opens the doors for support services. There are some that are meant for other reasons. So I would need more information. I need to know like what program they're on in order to really kind of give a better answer. But as a general answer, at age 18, again, you should you need to make sure that the child is connected to a Medicaid program that it, uh, is based on a disability criteria, so it will connect into DDD. Um, how long does the process generally take to get a decision on SSI or Medicaid eligibility? Varies dramatically. Could be a couple months, could be longer. Um, it, so SSI at a minimum is gonna take two to three months, could take longer than that, and the same thing with SSI. And then it depends on if there's a problem, like if they see something or they need more information, um, you know, it could take longer than that. Okay. So I um, want to talk about one other thing that's um, connecting Social Security and Medicaid. Um, so for a child with a disability who um, is receiving a Social Security benefit like SSI before the age of 22 um, and, and continues to receive that, so they um, re remain a disabled adult child um, at a point where a parent either dies, retires and collects their own benefit, or becomes disabled and collects their own benefit, the child will be entitled to receive a benefit on the parent's work history. So very often what we see happening, so a parent will um, retire, begin collecting their benefit, their child with a disability will get a letter saying, oh, we've determined you to be a disabled adult child. You're entitled to a benefit that's approximately half of the benefit that your parent is receiving. So sometimes an, an individual might be receiving a benefit of $1,200, $1,300 a month through a parent. So you get this letter that says that your child's going to start to receive this $1,200 a month based on your work history. Then you get a letter from SSI that says, well, now you've got earned income that's over um, the 780, you're gonna lose your SSI. And parents are like, oh, all right, so I'm losing 500, but I'm getting 1200. Okay, that's not such a bad deal, that's fine. And then you get the letter that says you're losing your Medicaid because your Medicaid was based on the fact that you were getting SSI. And now your child has unearned income of $1,200 which also will eliminate the child from the ability to get age blind disabled because that's over their income allowance. Um, this is not a moment to panic because the government has actually fixed this. Um, so in this particular scenario, if the child was getting SSI, getting Medicaid through SSI, then got this benefit on the parent, lost their Medicaid, the child is entitled to get their Medicaid back through the Board of Social Services as a DAC and what that means is that 
the Board of Social Services looks at the application, puts the invisibility cloak over the money that the child is getting from the parent from Social Security and says, we cover that up and that's not here, would the child be eligible for SSI, which means the resources have to remain below 2000, any other income has to be below the 780. The answer to that is yes, the child gets their Medicaid back. So it's just an extra step that you would have to do. But on the other hand, the upside of it is, is that your child will be receiving this $1,200 $1, benefit or whatever, that, that's what I made up, but whatever the benefit is that they would receive on the parent's work history, for the rest of their life, which gives them a larger monthly amount coming in, which is definitely a benefit worth having. And since it doesn't jeopardize their Medicaid, you just have to know to take those steps. Um, it really puts the child in a very good position. Additionally, 24 months after receiving a benefit on a parent, the child will be eligible for Medicare. So the child will get Medicare, Medicaid, and a higher monthly benefit. Any questions on that? No questions? Okay. I actually do have a question oh, on that. Sure. So if you don't know right now what your social security benefit's gonna be, but maybe this scenario you're playing out is gonna be better for our son you just proceed as normal now and then upon retirement figure it out i, I yeah. i'm just worried that you if you do one no it's not like if you do one it's not like if you do one thing you lose the ability to do this the only way you lose the ability to do this is if the child works substantially because then they you got to think of it as they're breaking the chain to the parent so for instance like if i became disabled tomorrow, I wouldn't be able to say, I want to collect on my dad's work history because I've worked for years. So I'd I would have to be connected to my own work history, right? So if your child with a disability is working and creates enough of their own social security record, they would be entitled to receive on themselves and they've worked over SGA, then they will not be able to collect on a parent. So that's the only thing that will break the chain. So it's not really something that you can um, kind of orchestrate it's just something really to be aware of. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions on that? Okay. So I just have a backtracking question. Do you want that sure. at the very end? No, you can do it now. Back on. Okay. Um, can you talk about the ABLE account and what it provides? Certainly. So the ABLE account, Achieving a Better Life Experience account, is an account that's set up by the federal government with the goal of allowing for families to um, put aside money for an individual with disability to help them with their needs. Um, the funds that go into the account, there are certain rules about it. So you can't put in more than $15,000 in a year. When the funds are taken out, they have to be used for the individual for anything that the, would enhance the individual with a disability's life. So again, can't spend it on somebody else, can only spend it on that person. You can spend those funds on um, food, clothing, and shelter, which you can't do from a special needs trust. So this, this one area makes this advantageous is because you can use it to pay rent, which you can't do with your special needs trust. Um, if this account has more than $100,000 in it, it will jeopardize SSI. And if it has more than $300,000 in it, it will jeopardize Medicaid. So you do have to be careful with regard to that. And for an individual who's actually working and wants to put some of their work money in, they do have an ability to put an extra $7,000 a year in. So let's say your child is working, you put $15,000 a year in, and the child wants to save some of their work money, they can go over that 15, um, but only up to 22,000. So those are the rules with um, the ABLE account. Um, again, when the child passes any money that's left in there, first goes back to the government to repay any lien, and then would pass out to what would otherwise be the child's estate if there was anything that would be left. Um, that's the ABLE account. Any, any other questions, or did that answer that? Can you have an ABLE account and a trust? Absolutely can, and you should. Um, I think the best, 
you know, sometimes to do something, you need your whole toolbox. So your whole toolbox would include a third party special needs trust and an ABLE account because funds can go from your third party special needs trust into that ABLE account, giving a lot more flexibility. Um, so I think having both of those things really would set up a child with a disability for the future when parents are not here to provide for them. So we're going to talk a little bit about DDD because I know that this was really SSI Medicaid, but it did say other entitlements and Angela and I spoke at the beginning and she said it would be a good idea to kind of bring that in um, as well. So DDD, the Division of Developmental Disabilities, is the actual agency that will provide services to an individual with disabilities once they are 21 at the end of their educational entitlement and if the individual has Medicaid. So we've already taken care of that Medicaid part. We all know how to do it. We're going to go out and get make sure that our child has Medicaid so that they can tap into these DDD services. So how, how do we apply for, Medi um, for DDD and what is that criteria? So it's a simple application that has to be filled out. If um, your child is already connected to perform care, there's a short form application. If your child is not connected to perform care, there's a long form application. You just choose it. They're easily Googleable. Um, just kind of put that into a search and the application will come up, fill it out, send it in with the, the um, requested documentation. The criteria for being eligible for DDD services is that the individual has a disability, it manifests before the age of 22, it is likely to continue indefinitely, and it creates a substantial functional limitation in three of seven areas of life activity. And those areas are self-care, so that's all about what it takes to get yourself ready. So it's getting up, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, doing your hair, getting dressed, all of that stuff. That's your activities of daily living, your self-care. Receptive and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction. So self-direction is the ability to plan and implement um, your independent activities of daily living, which are different than your self-care skills. These are the kind of skills that allow you to live on your own. So cooking, grocery shopping, following a recipe, doing laundry, cleaning, making a bed, um, banking, all those kinds, of, using public transportation, all of those types of activities are your independent activities of daily living. And the last one is um, economic self-sufficiency. Um, so if while I was saying those and you were thinking about your child, you're like, yep, got a substantial functional limitation, in at least three of those areas, then your child would likely be eligible for DDD services. So the question always becomes, well, how does the division determine whether the individual actually has a substantial functional limitation? So the way that they do that is they have a survey. It's the New Jersey Comprehensive Assessment Tool. After you send in your application to DDD, somebody will contact you to do the NJCAT. Currently, again, due to COVID, they're doing them via phone. So they'll set up a time to talk to you and they'll run through the questions. And what they're looking for is for you to provide information about your child based on your child, I'm sorry, um, based on your child um, kind of in a world that doesn't exist where they're, they're living on their own. How would they be able to function if somebody's not reminding them, prompting them or helping them um, to make sure that all of these tasks are done? So I often tell clients, well, kind of put your child in this imaginary world, pretend they're in their apartment all by themselves. You leave them on a Sunday, your apartment's clean, they've got clean clothes, they've got food, everything's wonderful. You don't talk to a child, you don't see the child, you don't do anything. You come back the next week, what are you going to find? So that's kind of what you want to be able to portray when you're doing this NJ cat, right? Um, so they ask you questions on there and the um, responses are independent, supervision, lots of assistance. And they'll ask a whole lot of questions about activities of daily living. So brushing one's teeth, blowing one's nose, getting dressed, um, eating, toileting, all of those things. Independent, if you're gonna check that box, means that there is nothing about this activity that is on your radar. You don't think about it. You don't worry that your child has done it. You don't worry about they're going to do it. You don't want to tell them about it. Like you just know it's going to be done. 
that's independent. If at all you have to think about whether or not the child will do whatever that thing is, you cannot check that independent box because then the child is not truly independent. So then you kind of have to figure out, is my child, do they only need supervision or do they really need physical assistance? So if all you have to do is say to the child, please go take a shower and they go and they do it and they do a great job and they come out and they're all good to go and ready, well then that's fine. Then that would be supervision. Um, if on the other hand, the child goes in to take the shower and comes out and you're like, oh, all right, they didn't use shampoo, their hair is still dirty, um, they didn't really soap up or there's still soap on them. And it's like, you need to really go in there and help them if you're going to get a decent result from this activity then they need lots of assistance, right? If you're completely setting up their environment. So before they get in there, you're gonna go in and you're gonna put the soap, the shampoo, the clean towel, you're gonna to put everything out for them. Like you've set this up so they have to succeed, <laughs> right? That's lots of assistance. Um, so you kind of have to figure out where you are in that. Why is this important? Well, because this NJ cat not only determines eligibility, but it also determines the budget for the individual. And the budgets vary dramatically. And what's important, it's not that it's not important that you get the most, the largest budget with the most amount of money. It's important that you get the budget that matches your child's needs. Because if there's a mismatch, your child will likely end up not having enough funds to actually have them get the services that they need. Whether that be in a day program or down the road in the future in a residential setting, there won't be enough money for them to actually get the support services that are required for them to be safe and cared for. So you definitely wanna make sure that you're taking your time with the survey. It is online. Um, you can get a sample version of it. You can go through it. You can think about the answers. And I really recommend that you do because when you're sitting there the first time somebody's asking you these questions, you're probably not gonna think through everything, but if you do it yourself and then you're watching your child for like the next week afterwards, all of a sudden you're going to pay attention to, well, I thought they were doing that, but now that I'm realizing it, I'm actually tying their shoe for them or because these things become such routine for us, we don't even realize the extent of what we're doing. So you want to be very careful about that um, and how it's being filled out just so that you don't have a mismatch in that budget um, between what the child needs and what would be able to be provided through DDD. Any questions on that? I, I have a question. Um, so uh, it, can you be uh, eligible for DDD without SSI or Medicaid? Uh, and can you be eligible for that like at the age 15? Okay, so no, not at the age of 15. So I'll, but I, I'll talk about performed care for a second. So hang on a second to that part. So DDD, you have to be um, determined eligible, um, and in order to get services, you have to be 21 and the end of your educational entitlement. You can apply at 18, and I strongly recommend that you do apply at 18, because this way, if there's any glitches with it, you can work those glitches out um, before your child is 21 and you actually need the services. And DDD only provides services for individuals who are Medicaid eligible. Now, they can still determine the child eligible if you don't have Medicaid. You'll get a letter that says you're clinically eligible, but we can't provide services until you have Medicaid. Um, so you can still, you can apply. So at 18, you're applying for SSI, you're applying, you know, which will get you your Medicaid and you're applying for DDD at the same time. You don't have to wait for the Medicaid to send in your DDD application. That's totally fine. But your question was if the person is 15, so for an individual who's 15, you want to contact Perform Care. Um, you can Google them. Their number will come up. Their intake is usually done over the phone. I'm pretty sure they're actually 24 hours because they are a crisis um, agency. So you can contact them and start your application process. Um, you don't have to have Medicaid for their services because many children under the age of 18 would not be eligible for Medicaid if the family income and resources are being counted and perform care provide services for an individual with disability from birth up until 20 to their 21st birthday. So if there are services that you need now, um, you could reach out to them. Perform care services 
Um, so I'm not sure what you're exactly looking for service-wise, but they can provide some behavioral supports, um, some respite, camp stipends, which of course I guess don't apply during COVID, um, and some other types of support services. For the most part, no government agency is required to provide services that you can get from someplace else that's performed care in DDD. And for the most part, you're gonna get a lot of your services through your school district. Um, but if it's something that's beyond what the school district would provide, that's where performed care would, would um, step in for a child who's 15. Any questions on that? A few. <laughs> um, Thanks. I have NJ health insurance that is that Medicaid. I also have applied at the Board of Social Services at my local county, but I am not informed through them what my child needs is eligible for. I keep telling my social service worker of my special needs son who um, who's almost a teenager, but can I be eligible for it if the Board of Social Services is of no help? Do I go straight to the supervisor? Okay, so <laughs> it's a lot in there and I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. So it sounds like somebody's having difficulty with their Board of Social Services. If you're not getting a response, you're not getting, first of all, do everything in writing um, because you want a paper trail for this. So if you're calling and you're just leaving messages and you're not getting any information back, I would send something in writing and absolutely go to a supervisor. I'd also say that probably some of this is due to COVID. So people are not in the office in, in the same fashion as they normally would be. So maybe that's why they're not getting back to you. I'm a little unclear on what exactly exactly the issue is so it, from from my perspective like to answer a question of whether she'd be eligible and i wouldn't be able to do that but yes she should raise this to a supervisor level and try to get a response or an answer but from the board of social services you're going to be getting services like medicaid utility assistance food stamps they handle that whole broad base type of services um not DDD, so you know DDD, DVR, that's not connected there. They're their own application processes that are separate and not SSI because that's through the Social Security Administration. Uh, when is it best to apply for both DDD and NJCAT if we are still in the process of getting approved for SSI? I would do it at the exact same time. I would send everything in at age 18. I wouldn't wait for my SSI application to be processed. I would go ahead and send it in. If you plan to apply for guardianship, what is the age you should start the process? So if you plan to apply for guardianship, um, you need to, the earliest that you can submit a guardianship application to the court is at 18. Um, if you're going to contact an attorney to help you with this, um, you would want to contact the attorney six months before the 18th birthday. Um, because papers have to be drafted, doctor's appointments need to be made, doctors have to sign certifications, and everything has to then be sent into the court. Okay. Also recommended on the school end of it, um, that when you are looking for guardianship, that you're also getting the most um, recent evaluations. So they don't want something that's more than a year old. And we've heard in some cases recently, um, and recently being last year, that some wanted them even um, le less less than a year old. But so you want to make sure your evals are up to date, and that you know your doctor's appointments that uh, uh, Maria was talking about. You're going to have to have it done by your doctor. It has to be no more than 30 days before your court date. So you really want to start getting your ducks in a row starting six months before. Yeah. So let me just clarify a little tiny bit on that. So for guardianship purposes, we don't actually need evaluations. We only need two doctors to certify, and those doctors do have to be within 30 days. So if we're and we're so let's say your child's birthday is. Um, January 30th, the earliest that the doctors could have seen your child is January 1st. Um, and you have two doctors and they, you know, they both have to be right around that same time. We really recommend that you do it like two weeks before because otherwise it's very tight to get it in with mailing time into the court. Um, but just two doctors have to certify to the fact that the individual needs a guardian. It is still a great idea to get all your evaluations up to date right around this period of time because who is that really good for? 
it's really helpful for your DDD application. It's helpful for your SSI applications. It's helpful for your Medicaid applications to have those evaluations because they are going to request them. Um, but guardianship itself is a special evaluation um, at all for the court, unless there's a question of whether the child actually needs a guardian. So in a clear case, you don't need those. If it's a very borderline case, then additional evaluations can be requested. So that would be something you would have to kind of be aware of um, with where your child's functioning level is. And that criteria is different than DDD and it's different than SSI and Medicaid. They're looking for an inability to govern and manage one's own affairs, which really means to be able to give informed consent. So for an individual to be able to weigh risks and benefits, um, of medical treatment, legal decisions, financial decisions. So it's more of that higher level functioning that the court is looking for. So it's a little bit, each one of these things looks for something different. Um, and we all look at our child as like, I have a disability, it should be clear, but each one of these is a tiny bit different. Um, is the first step to apply for DDD to fill out the NJCAT also, will the NJCAT be a short form if the applicant already has performed care? And how do we choose a good support coordinating agency? Okay. So the NJCAT is not the application, it's a survey. So the application is step one, and that's where you can have a short form if you are ready or with performed care, but a long form if you're not with performed care. When that application goes in and with it, you're going to put records. They ask for records. So they're going to want to see most recent IEP, the triannual reviews, some doctor um, diagnosis letters. Um, if your child is getting speech OTPT, they're going to want to see evaluations and reports from that. So you're going to send all of those things in. When DDD gets it, they'll call you to set up a time to do the NJCAT. So that comes after. Everybody does the same NJCAT. It doesn't matter if you're with Perform Care or not. It's the same survey, the same question. And there was one more question. I forgot what the question was. There's, there was another part to that. How, how do we choose the good, a good support coordinating agency? So I have, I, I'm sorry. I have some um, questionnaires and brochures that could help that were created so that you can interview your agency um, as a family and then also as an individual. So I can send those home to help. There might be more ways of doing it also, but it's, it's basically yeah. you get to interview and it, it helps you to at least give you guidelines and questions and maybe you come up with your own. So I'll send that home tonight. Yeah, that would be great. That would be wonderful. It's one of the hardest things to do is to pick a good support coordinator. Um, so again, this isn't really like legal advice. This is just sort of practical advice. Talk to the parents whose kids are like a year or so older than yours that you know. Find out who they're using and find out if they're happy. Find out if it's an agency that they're happy with or if it's a particular support coordinator because you and your best friend can go to the exact same agency but get a different person and her person is phenomenal and your person is pathetic. <laughs> so you want to, because it all depends on the individual. It really does. Um, there's no great, there's no great like formula to doing this, but if you have a questionnaire, I know, um, there are other questionnaires that have been set up by different advocacy agencies of questions you should ask. Um, some of it's real easy. Like you go through the list for DDD, they have it online and you look for the, your county, you start calling. Some places aren't going to call you back. Some places are going to call you back and you're going to start asking questions and you're going to tell instantaneously that you know more than what they know about this area. That's not the person you want. You want somebody who's really understands what's going on and understands the ins and outs of the system because they're going to be your liaison. Like they do all that background paperwork to make sure that when you pick a program that the paperwork's in place and the funds flow to that spot. Um, and they really should be there to help ease you through finding a program. And that's really the most important piece of it because they should be able to say, here's everything that's in your county, in your area, that would match for your child. So you want to make sure it's somebody who really has some experience. I find the best way to do it is to actually talk to somebody who's using that agency and know that they're good. You want somebody who's going to call you back, who you're going to be able to get in touch with. Um, um, do you recommend applying for SSI first before applying for Medicaid? If my child is not approved, can I reapply? 
So if you're going to apply for SSI, you're not applying for Medicaid separately because SSI will automatically get you your Medicaid. Um, what the other, uh, oh, if you can't, yes. If, so if you're not, a, well, first of all, if, you, if you're denied eligibility for SSI, depending on what it is, if you're denied eligibility because you're over the resource limit, don't appeal it, go fix it, and then reapply. If you're denied eligibility because you're over an income limit, figure out if it can be fixed. And if it can be fixed, fix it, fix it and reapply. If you're denied because they do not believe that the person has a disability, you must appeal that. If you don't appeal it, it's as if you said to them, you're correct, I agree. And that's gonna have some long range effects because now you've agreed that the person doesn't have a disability that thing I talked about before with getting a benefit on a parent, you may actually preclude yourself from doing that. So you do want to appeal the fact that they think that the individual does not have a disability. Um, but those are the three reasons why you could be denied. Um, and you would definitely want to appeal the denial of a disability on the other two, if they're fixable, fix them and then reapply. Um, if you are not happy with your support coordinator, is it difficult to change? Not at all. You fill out a form, you send it in, and you just change. It's totally at the parents, um, parents guardians, um, you know, discretion. Okay. Mrs. Gibby, do you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> I do. Am I on mute? Um, yeah, you're not I'm, muted. You're I'm good. Jumping back, um, jumping back to the guardianship um, sure. section that we were discussing. Um, you mentioned uh, that you um, they, you only need two doctors to certify. Aside from the general practitioner, what other doctor would that be? What other doctor does your, um, does your child have another doctor? That's my question. If you only have a general practitioner who- does, Okay, sorry. I, I thought you were asking what, <laughs> what other types. Um, so for instance, when I um, had to do my daughter's guardianship, she didn't have any specialist in her life at that moment. Mm -hmm. My pediatric group had like 20 doctors. So we picked two doctors from her group. So is your doctor a group or is a one solo person? It's a group. Then you can choose another doctor. It's not the court's favorite thing. They prefer that it be two doctors who are not connected, but they accept it all the time. So yeah, if you have two doctors in the group, you can have two doctors from the same group certified to the disability. And just a follow-up, how long does that process take? Guardianship? Yeah. We, if you submit the papers at the child's 18th birthday, your court date is usually six to eight weeks later. And as long as there's no hiccup or glitch in it where you know somebody objects to it or it's contested or anything along those lines, it, it will usually be done within six to eight weeks of the um, 18th birthday. Or six to, eight to, six to eight weeks from when you submit the file to right. the court. But if we're doing it at the 18th birthday, that would be six to eight weeks from the 18th birthday. Okay, did you have a question? Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? How do we get the support coordinator? So once you're determined to be eligible for DDD services, you will get a form. Actually, the form's on their website, so you can always just go print it. You fill it out. They ask you to put down two choices. Who's your first choice? Who's your second choice? And you send it in, and then DDD processes it, and you'll get called by the support coordinator who ends up being assigned to your case. Are they assigned? Are the, the coordinators assigned or do you get to interview the coordinator themselves at the agency? So if I like agency A and then I want to, I would like to talk with the coordinators there, am I allowed to do that and then come up with one and two? Or do I just look and say they're, Stats so the one and two is the agency, mm -hmm. but then when you're talking to the agency, you can, rec you can request a specific person within the agency. They will tell you um, if that person's caseload will allow them to take on someone. Like I had one particular person for my daughter and I called up the agency and I was like, I know this person's really good. And they were like, well, yeah, but she's completely and totally booked. Um, we have somebody who's brand new who we're training. Um, we could give you that person. And I was like, okay, fine. And turned out that person's fabulous as well. So I'm super happy. Um, but 
as far as as DDD goes, you're really doing the agency, and then you talk to the agency to um, figure out who within that agency it is that you would want. Can you change agencies later if you don't like them? Absolutely. I yeah, without a doubt, and it's super easy to do. It's it really. This fee-for-service world sets it up so that the parent is in the driver's seat and they are able to make these kinds of changes and decisions. So, yes. Any other questions? Anything else you want me to cover with regard to either SSI, Medicaid, or DDD, or anything? They miss anything that you wanted covered or I'm not seeing anyone. I think Ross just raised. Oh, well, yes. Mrs. Stacey. Gibby. Stacey. Um, very quickly back to the guardianship. Sure. Uh, how do we how do we um, if, if we've missed the 18 year mark? He's older oh. than 18. So you're older than eight, the child's older than 18. No worries. I've done guardianship for somebody like who's 50. It's fine. It, it, you just can't do it before. You could do it anytime after. And, and how do we go about that? What, who are we trying to, who are we contacting for an application or a, a court date or? Okay. So you need to file what's called a verified complaint with the court. Um, so Okay, so I would recommend that you would call an attorney. I called and I didn't do, I was in law school when I did my daughters and I didn't do it myself. I hired a firm to, I hired this firm to do it before I was part of this firm um, because I just wouldn't do it myself. It doesn't, you know, you want somebody who knows what they're doing. You've got notice deadlines, you've got requirements. It, um, so I would say that's what you would do. If you wanted to try to do it yourself, um, you can Google, there are forms on the court website um, and there are some instructions I believe um, and you can try to do it yourself but it's a verified complaint you have to do an order to show cause you have certifications for the doctors consent forms for certain individuals within the family um, a judgment those things all have to be gotten together with these certifications and have to be submitted into the court with a filing fee um, and when the court gets them, they will appoint a court appointed attorney for the individual. That attorney will come out, meet with the individual, meet with the proposed guardians. They do a report back to the court. Uh, depending on the county that you're in, um, that attorney also charges for their time. Um, sometimes in certain counties, they will appoint a public defender to do this, in which case there's not a fee for that attorney. Um, however, the public defender's office is um, very often overworked and will ask for a four month continuance or adjournment. So they normally will get it. It'll turn the process into going from six to eight weeks to something like four to six months. Um, but that is also an option depending on the county that you're in. Um, there may or may not be a hearing that is required. Um, and again, that depends on your county. Um, but that's kind of the process. So, I mean, you can try to do it yourself. Um, by looking at the court website um, and starting to fill out those papers, so. And is the process similar if you say terminate the guardianship, if say, the individual uh, develops significantly or you want to transfer it to a different guardian? Okay, so if the individual regains capacity, um, you do have to go back to court because the judge would have to rule that the guardianship was no longer necessary. Um, in most instances, it requires one doctor, not necessarily two. It, it, it will depend on the strength of that doctor's certification, but you do have to go back to court. As far as transferring to another guardianship, do you mean at a point where, let's say, if the parents passed? Yeah, or the parents uh, reached a certain age where they'd prefer for uh, the sibling of the individual to be the guardian? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's called adding a co-guardian. Um, or substitute guardian for removing a parent and putting a child on. And that's a slightly different process. That process does not require 
doctor certifications because we've already determined for the court that the individual lacks capacity and therefore needs a guardian. It's more just switching somebody out. So it's a slightly different process, but you still do have to go to court. That would have to be done by a judge. Okay. And, and if that's the case, well, I was going to say, if that's the case, does it make sense to have multiple guardians initially? But right now that particular sibling is, is uh, younger than 18, so it's irrelevant. Right, it really doesn't make sense and the court really frowns upon that. So two guardians, they're really comfortable with doing. They don't particularly like to do much more than that unless there's a reason, like a medical reason. One of the parents is very sick, um, you know, but when you're older, they're very fine with doing that. Another thing, I mean, since we're on this topic that you should keep in mind is when you are the guardian for somebody, you do want to put in your will who would take over in the event that you're no longer able to serve. Um, it's, that's really sort of the safety net for the tragedy, like both parents go out for a car ride and there's an, a tragic accident and you know, that doesn't typically happen. So typically what happens is, you know, one parent passes and the other parent is now putting on a typically developing child to be co with them. And then when that second parent passes, then that child is just taking over. But you do wanna have that in your will um, just in case there is. I've only ever had that happen one one time where that particular provision had to be used um, to appoint the next guardian. So it, it doesn't happen often, but it can happen and it is a good idea to have that in your will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you another question, do you need to go for full guardianship? That depends on the individual's functioning level. So um, a guardianship is based on um, three major areas, medical, financial, and legal. So if an individual can make some of those decisions, but not all of those decisions, you can carve out what they are able to make decisions for and leave that with the individuals, but they retain the capacity for the following types of decisions. But those are definitely things that you would work out um, with the attorney who you're working with and then with the court appointed attorney um, so that the court is aware that we believe that the individual has capacity and the doctors also have to agree with that. So if the doctors say that the individual can't make any decisions, it's going to be very hard for a parent to say, well, even though the doctors say that he can't make financial decisions, I think he can. Um, so it's kind of all the information has to inform to the same um, end result. But that is definitely something to discuss with an attorney when you're working with them. Any other questions? I did have a question going back to the NJ cat, and unless sure. there are any other guardian questions. Um, is it better to fill the NJ cat online? You can't. It's not an option to fill it out online. You can go online and you can print it and you can do it for yourself, but you can't then mail it into the division. The division does it um, by way so there was a point in time where they used to send you an online survey. They stopped that approximately a year or so ago and they turned it into a DDD worker coming to your house with their computer and sitting there and doing it with you. Because of COVID that's now switched to doing a phone call. So it's not an option for you to just do it online, hit click and submit it into them anymore. Any other questions? Okay. Well, it is almost nine o'clock. I don't know if anybody else is tired. <laughs> <laughs> done a lot of talking. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to still answer questions, so I don't want you to feel like, you know. I see a question down here at the yes. bottom. His hand is up, and, and Albie's too. Go ahead, Albie. Um, what if? My like, so number one, DDD can't deny you, right? DDD cannot deny you, right? From DDD. Well, they they can deny you if you don't meet their eligibility criteria. And if they do, if they do deny you, let's say, and you, and you, and you physically meet them, what what's how do you get how do you get you have to go for a judge again and. Right. So if if you go if. if 
if you fill out your application for DDD and they say that you're not, you don't meet the eligibility criteria. Okay. You have an appeal process. Anytime that you are asking your government for something and they are denying it of you, you always have an appeal process. So you would appeal and that appeal process would have you first having a meeting with DDD to present your case. And if they still don't agree, then yes, you would go to a hearing before a judge. Yes. And also about the guardianship, also about the guardianship. Let's say one of my parents becomes my guardian. Am I, am I, am, am I able to make now appointments, like doctor appointments, or once they're the guardian, they're not allowed to do that anymore. Is that correct? So what, what, if you have a guardian, you want to know if you can actually call up and make a doctor's appointment? Yes. Or no, you're not allowed to. No, you can. You can do you that. Still, you can? I thought, I, that's what I, I was told that you can't do that. To so call up and say to the doctor that you want to go to the doctor on a certain day? So yeah. guardianship puts somebody in a position to make decisions for you that you cannot make for yourself. Okay. Um, if you're able to make a decision, your guardian is supposed to support you and be a part of it and help you to make that decision as best possible. Okay. But I, I, where it's a decision you can't make, then the guardian will step in and make it. So for instance, if you're trying to make a doctor's appointment, but you need mom to drive you there, you probably want to check with her. Um, but you can definitely call up and make an appointment. Yes. And I I do have an, I do have a question. See, I got my social security, but when when they see when they appealed for me, when they got it for me, the social they gave me well care. They gave me well care insurance card. And do you know do you, now when is when can you change the insurance card, for instance, and what insurance is the best? Per, per provider since you are a lawyer. Okay, so I think what you're saying is that you got you got your SSI and then you got your letter saying that you were eligible for Medicaid and they asked you to pick a provider. And they already, they gave it to me. They gave me WellCare. Right, so, okay, so then they picked WellCare for you. There is an open enrollment. I don't know when that is, but there is a point in time each year where you are able to switch. I don't know what that is. Um, like, I don't know what the dates for that are. Okay. You can probably Google that, and you are able to switch from one to another. And if, like, so let's say my parents' provider is Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, there's been a couple times that I tried, um, I tried, the couple times I tried calling doctor appointments for me, and they said you can't have, you can't take Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield if you can't use Inlet because that's not your first provider. If the Blue Cross Blue Shield is your private insurance, that would be your primary provider. It wouldn't be. Oh, but that's my secondary. Net. Well, then you have something else that's primary. Well care. Well care is my primary. Well, if well care is Medicaid. It's not your primary. That's gonna oh. be your, that's going to be a payer of last resort if it's actually your Medicaid provider. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. I was just okay. I was just curious. Okay. All right. So any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. All. Um, I hope that you got some good information and understand these benefits a little bit more than you did before we started. Um, and thank again, thank you for inviting me. I'm pleasure to be here. And if you want us to come out again for another topic, please do contact us and let us know. We're happy to do this. So thank you very much. Ms. Gierko, did you have a question? I think your hand is up. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And thanks okay. to everybody who joined us. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.